We often think of the annual Christmas lecture as a child of the television age. Yet it's a yuletide tradition that reaches back to a time before radio, when public communication was very much a live event. More importantly, the Christmas lecture became a flagship for the public understanding of science and a shop window for the discoveries of the age. It also combines science with education and entertainment, which today is the cornerstone of the modern documentary. Throughout the 19th century, the public was fascinated by innovative science and utterly enthralled to famous scientists. Christmas lectures gave people the chance to witness scientific phenomena up close and rub shoulders with eminent men. The most prominent of these was the celebrated scientist Michael Faraday. It was Faraday who, in 1825, founded the first Christmas lectures, which have been held annually at the Royal Institution in London ever since. They quickly became a Christmas ritual for well-to-do families and were widely emulated by other institutions. Great emphasis was placed on showmanship and the lectures increasingly featured spectacular demonstrations of science in action. One of the most popular communicators of the age was Frank Buckland, who was already a well-known public personality. His was the first name that came to mind when a series of natural history lectures specifically for young people was proposed by the Royal Society for the Encouragement of Arts and Manufacturers. My name is Michael Stephen Clark and I've been fascinated by Frank Buckland for most of my professional life. I worked for many years at Buckland's old stamping ground, the Regent's Park Zoo in London, and it was there that I learned just how influential he really was. I've always considered the communication of species conservation to be the most important part of zoo work. Perhaps that's why I identify so readily with Buckland. He was a hands-on advocate for animals, and I'm not alone in recognising him as a kindred spirit. Now, as a writer, I frequently turn to Buckland for inspiration and ideas. I see him less as an icon of natural history and more as a visionary who saw that public understanding was key to the guardianship of the natural world. Buckland was a prolific writer and communicator, but his 1874 lectures stand out as a neat summary of Frank Buckland's worldview. In December 1873, the RSA commissioned Frank Buckland to deliver a series of holiday lectures. It could be argued that they were late to the game. By that time, the Christmas lectures had begun to wane as a promotional tool and a must-see event. Nevertheless, Buckland's lectures offered something out of the ordinary. Firstly, they were aimed specifically at children, accompanied by adults, rather than the paterfamilias and his extended family. They were also more accessible in terms of subject matter and presentation. This paraphrased report from the Society's Journal shows just how much they saw an appeal to the young as an important priority. It has been determined by the Council to provide lectures suitable for a juvenile auditory during the Christmas holidays. Arrangements have been made with Mr Frank Buckland, Her Majesty's Inspector of Fisheries, to deliver two lectures on the structure and habits of beasts, birds and fishes, as shown, beauty and design. These lectures will be illustrated by museum specimens and living animals. As the lectures are intended specifically for children, it is hoped that only ladies accompanying the children will make use of the tickets. I discovered an account of Buckland's lecture in the Aberdeer Times, a regional newspaper of the time. It paints a detailed picture of Buckland at the peak of his fame, charming his listeners into submission with tongue-in-cheek allegory and laconic comic relief. Among the many reasons for Buckland's popularity were his natural showmanship and his adroit handling of some astonishing props. The likes of David Attenborough and Gerald Durrell invariably had a live example of nature to hand, 
in the course of their pieces to camera. Some wildlife presenters have even been rash enough to engage physically with some of their most dangerous subjects. Few, however, would pitch up for a lecture in the round with a carnival of live animals at their disposal. Buckland's lecture was wide-ranging and he chose to illustrate it with examples sourced from his many contacts in the animal trade. He was close friends with taxidermists, private collectors, zoo staff and one of London's most successful animal dealers, Charles Jamrach. The Aberdare Times reports that Buckland presented, among other things, the skins of animals, stuffed specimens of wild beasts and birds, models of limbs of men and animals, preserved heads, beaks and claws of birds, and a large collection of living birds of various sizes, and a sloth from the collection of Mr Jamrach. However, Mr Frank Buckland's opening remarks today would empty the Albert Hall before the first interval. It was not true, Buckland declared, that man had descended from the monkey, for there were points of distinction between them which could not be reconciled. Mr Buckland was not a monkey himself, and yet it had been said that wherever there was a slight projection on the top of the ear, then that animal was said to be descended from the monkey. The gorilla was most like man, continued Buckland unabashed, but it would be found that his teeth were made for cracking nuts and not for eating Christmas pudding. Ho, 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 indeed. Not content with that, Frank Buckland produced a myriad factoids that he flourished like a stream of conjurer's coloured handkerchiefs. He had nothing up his sleeve, though, except the intention to dazzle. He regaled his young fans with a whirlwind tour of the animal kingdom. No creature was too great or too small in his consideration. All of them supported the creationist argument that he threaded through his auditory. Bears, kangaroos, red deer, the eagle, the woodpecker, anteater and dodo, pheasants, a piping crow, the kookaburra, zebra finches, chestnut finches and piping bullfinches were then severally explained. Specimens of some of them were exhibited, including fox and wolf furs from the stores of Mr Nicholas of Oxford Street. The lecturer explained that these furs were always at their best in the coldest part of the year in the countries from which they came. The creator, Buckland said, had so provided for the wants of his creatures not, that not one of them suffered from the variations of climate. Buckland also had the homely touch when it came to homily. His anthropomorphic anecdotes about Guy Fawkes, the baby hippo, who cheeked his father and made faces at him, ensured that he was listened to with great attention throughout and appeared to be heartily enjoyed by the hundreds of little holiday folks who were present. Yet posterity almost immediately left Buckland in its wake as Darwinism spread rapidly to become the New Testament of science. So, a few questions. Um, Frank Buckland died at a relatively young age. He was 54 when he passed away, and it's clear that he felt his life's work was unfinished. What do you think are the most important aspects of his legacy? Well, he had this huge life that was just crammed full of activities. Um, towards the end of his life, he had three main projects. Um, one of them was Land and Water, his journal, um, which he practically wrote himself. Uh, he was a fisheries inspector which took him all around the country and he also wrote the reports um, and he was also involved in efforts to try and get a fish museum established a bit like that natural history museum but exclusively for maritime topics um, he was actually dismissed at the time which is incredible when you think of the number of maritime museums and fisheries and exhibitions that there are now not, not least the Scottish Fisheries Museum at Anstruther, which is very much, I think, what Buckland had in mind um, because he was a big one for interpretation. But his legacy is definitely, I think, um, with the fisheries community, which is recognised, but I do think he needs to be more widely recognised. 
he was, <coughs> excuse me, he was quite a famous person in his own lifetime. Um, but immediately after he died, uh, he was almost forgotten. And his family wrote the first of three biographies about Frank Buckland. This is um, his brother-in-law, George Bumpus, um, writing a quite flattering account of Frank. Um, it's okay, but it's probably more interesting because it's largely based on Buckland's own letters and writings. Um, then we come to um, a fisheries scientist who wrote this book. It's my favourite one, um, The Curious World of Frank Buckland. Um, it's more sympathetic to Frank in terms of um, assessing his contribution to fisheries science and his contribution all round as a natural historian. Um, as you can see, I've bookmarked it many times. That was published in the 60s. And it's not until the 21st century that we get another biography of him. On the surface of it, this one kind of amplifies what Buckland was rather famous for, was basically his interest in exotic animals and what they tasted like. Um, but to me, that's always over-amplified. Um, to me, his big achievement was in the fisheries. And when I came to write my book, which is Mr. Buckland, Mr. Walpole, and Mr. Young. This is around Scotland with the fisheries men. And this is the three of them, these three fisheries inspectors, the Mandarin, the scientist, and the advocate, Scottish advocate, Archibald Young, all going around Scotland and reporting on the state of the herring fishery. I based that document, uh, that book rather, on this document. <coughs> and Buckland, as you can see, is the lead author. So he was not only responsible for, I think, organising many of the trips, but he was essentially responsible for the final document, which is incredibly detailed and contains first-hand verbatim accounts from everyone involved in the herring fishery, from the humblest fishermen to the biggest fish tuners in Edinburgh. <coughs> he was extremely popular as a popularizer of natural history and his reputation is pretty much sealed and rests upon these books, The Curiosities of Natural History. There is collected writings and there is nothing that isn't covered in them. Anything that lives, breathes, walks, crawls, flies is examined in this book or series of books. This feature we're making here is about the Christmas Lecture at the National Institution. How significant was Buckland's role in the history of the Christmas Lectures? Well, anyone involved in the Christmas Lectures as we know them today would say he's pretty insignificant. Um, back in Victorian times, the Christmas Lectures, were, Christmas lectures were essentially um, science spectaculars. And the subjects that they were interested in primarily were chemistry, physics, and technology. The natural sciences were always a little bit of a poor relation, uh, basically because you couldn't demonstrate experiments with them quite the same way. You, you couldn't set things on fire. Um, so, as I've said in my presentation, Buckland came to it quite late um, in the day. The lectures, had, the popularity of the lectures had started to wane. Uh, but nevertheless, the RSA decided to press on with it and commissioned a series of natural history lectures. Buckland was a little bit unique, in fact, a big, big, big bit unique in bringing along live animals to, to one of these public lectures. And they were in, immensely popular, as you can imagine, with small children, families. So in many respects, he was an early interpreter and communicator and presenter, but without television cameras. Here are the animals, I'll show them to you and I'll tell, them, tell you all about them. The Christmas lecture is long established as a television event and a Christmas tradition, yet it's relatively small as a part of the Christmas schedule on television. Is it still important for the public understanding of science? I think they are, um, and they don't form a big part of the Christmas television schedule anymore. Um, I think they're clearly popular as live events, 
they, they will almost certainly bring in an audience. But they're still significant because they're the sort of programs and sort of events that you would choose over something else or if you're sick of the run of the mill stuff at Christmas. Um, you know, if you've had enough, even if you've had enough of Morecambe and Wise at Christmas, there's still the, the Christmas lecture to enjoy. And they do tend to, to find the biggest and the best sound stars to front these shows. Um, I think probably what's more significant is that the premise of the Christmas lecture has percolated down into lots of different kinds of communication, including children's television shows, YouTube, the internet. But I think the most important element is that public communication of scientific subjects um, can appear anywhere, you know, zoological garden, in the classroom, at a wildlife centre, at a wildlife preserve, in obviously in Dundee where we live, um, we've got a, a science centre which is really encapsulates the entire premise, um, the raison d'etre if you like of the Christmas lecture in a fixed place, in a fixed exhibition. If Buckland were alive today, would he still be giving lectures at Christmas with the Carnival of Animals in tow? Well, you know, the health and safety officer wouldn't let him in the door, I don't think. But, um, yes, I think if he was given the opportunity, he would do it. Um, but to a certain extent, he wouldn't need to. Um, because he'd probably be happier as a tour guide at London Zoo. Leading people round all the exhibits, showing them the animals, telling them all about their habits and their lives, 365 days a year. And he'd probably do it for free. Great. Thank you very much. No problem.